morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome everyone to this week's Global Cafe. So my name is Katrina Bazanis. I'm a Director of Policy and Advocacy at the IFA, and also particularly excited for this session because I also lead our work in, in vision health at the IFA. So I'm pleased to moderate today's Global Cafe, which really aims to connect vision or eye health and healthy aging. And so as some of you may know, yesterday was World Sight Day, which is the global cap campaign that draws attention to the importance of eye care. And upcoming on, global, on October 15th is White Cane Safety Day, which aims to celebrate people who are blind or visually impaired. And so in honor of World Sight Day and also White Cane Safety Day, IFA is dedicating today's Global Cafe to the importance of vision health in older people. So not only the burden of vision loss and impairment for this group, but also the importance of appropriate eye care and ways that the aging and eye care sectors can unite to advance vision health of older people to support healthy aging and good quality of life. So to speak with us today about vision health and the intersection with aging, I'm pleased to welcome Ms. Christina Fasser to the Global Cafe. So Christina became involved in the vision health space first with the Swiss RP Society, or now Retina Swiss, as a founding member in 1979, and then later as its president, and then as its CEO. And Christina was then elected as, a, as the president of Retina International, and in this capacity, she participated in promoting research on a national and international level. And now Christina continues as an advisor and an advocate. Uh, so welcome, Christina. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Katerina. Good morning, good evening to everybody. Uh, it's very nice to see that there are so many people around here. Mm -hmm. My apologies for my voice, but uh, we have still summer outside in Switzerland, but my voice adapted to autumn. My apologies. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. Uh, so at the Global Cafe, we always like to go back to the beginning a little bit to learn a little bit about your story. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how did you first become involved in vision health and, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I was born with uh, inherited retinal degeneration. That means I was always visually impaired. However, I grew up as a child just thinking it's normal not to see in the dark to some stumble over things, etc. So I was diagnosed when I was 13 years old with retinitis pigment pigmentosa. And so also two of my brothers and sisters. And so we were living all with, all three of us, we were living with visual impairment all our lives. And of course I myself uh, had to change three times my professional career completely because I had to adapt to my losing eyesight. Uh, in 79, we started the Retina Swiss organization at that time called RP Society or Retinitis Pigmentosa Association. Nobody understood what it meant. But we as patients, we were just angry and we were also put off always to be told there is nothing to do. So we did a lot of support of research. Uh, the member in the United States, funding member there was the foundation fighting behind us. Today, the biggest organization promoting research and financing research and from the patient point of view to find cures to inherited retinal degenerations, but also to acquire retinal degenerations such as age-related macular dystrophies. So we were, at the moment when we started to do that, it, we were really idealists and there was, everybody told us, forget it, it will never happen. But we are now in the wonderful situation to have the first gene therapy for an inherited retinal uh, degeneration, which is successful and many others in the pipeline. And also for AMD, which was until the 2000s, an absolutely lost case. There is efficient treatment around for at least the worst situation with AMD. 
So mm -hmm. we started to do research, promote research, promote research by participating as patients in roads, research, giving blood samples, giving our family histories, helping to find the genetics, but also, of course, with funding and public awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I do want to take it back a little bit because I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, um, you know, how many people are, are aware of, of how big of a burden this is in older people and the, you know, yeah. the significant <clears throat> kind of effect on, on quality of life. But first, I wanted to ask, you know, you have kind of a unique um, or maybe not, maybe not entirely unique, but the experience of, you know, being a person with lived experience that you can then bring to your work and being a patient yourself. And so I'm wondering how that impacted your advocacy um, and just your, you know, how you kind of have operated in, in Retina Swiss, but also in Retina International as the president. Yes, I personally came in contact with independent living uh, movement in 83. That's a very long time ago and was absolutely fascinated by the idea that the person with the disability or the handicap is the expert of his or her own disability and that you can learn most from your peers. Of course, you need ophthalmologists, you need specialists in rehabilitation, but it is a difference when you talk from peer to peer, because it's a lived experience. And when I started to work here in Switzerland as a social worker and manager, as CEO of Retina Swiss, I could combine both. That means when I personally was seeing clients in Lausanne, for instance, which is 300 kilometers from Zurich, so I had to travel by train to go there, and we talked about possibilities of mobility that you could move around autonomously if you do the training and take a cane. Uh, and somebody then asked me, but how, Mrs. Foster, did you come here? I said, by train. And who came with you? I was alone. Then when I was talking about mobility and that it is possible, it had a completely different uh way to transfer it to the clients and the same thing when we talk among peers about what you can do in daily living and how you live it you have a basic understanding of each other of course then of my social worker background it's very clear i have always to check to make sure that when i'm doing peer counseling and my colleagues do peer counseling that we listen to our peer and not project our own ideas to the other, that we respect mutual uh, ideas and how you handle things and also have respect that not everybody handle a visual impairment the same way. Mm -hmm. That there are a lot of different ways to go to Rome, as we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's amazing work. And I think that, you know, is part of your success and the success of these organizations is that yeah. kind of ability to understand, to understand and relate to each other. Um, so I do, um, as I mentioned, want to, you know, provide a bit of background uh, for our audience today. So mm -hmm. can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about just the impact of vision loss on older people in particular, you know, how is vision impacted as we age? Yes, <clears throat> there are, I would say, three or four major causes that impact in aging your life. First, that perhaps many of you have already experienced or might experience soon, is with the time, the lens gets less mobile. And that means accommodation to the near starts to be difficult. And the result is you need reading glasses. So that's, everybody gets it. I think those that have myopia, a little bit get now a benefit of it that you could just can read without glasses for quite a long time. But 
that's just because you are short-sighted and had already a minus of diopteries. Then the next very common is cataract. Cataract when the lens get opaque and you can't see any more very well through it. You can imagine this an effect like a dirty window. And then this can be done very successfully with the surgery. The lens is replaced by an artificial lens and it is once again clear and you can see. So in industrialized countries, this is in major cases accessible to patients. There are, of course, some uh, people that might live in circumstances that they just don't have the knowledge that they can have surgery for this disease and that it's not granted to see very bad when you are aging. In less developed countries, as so the lesser income countries, this is still one of the major causes of severe visual implant. Uh, impairment or blindness in these countries because there are not enough ophthalmologists to do the surgeries. And second, the means, the funding is not available. So as we call it in these countries, it's cataract is cause of poverty related uh, blindness in the aging group. Another cause of severe visual impairment can be glaucoma, which is also closely linked to aging. Glaucoma, when you read about it, you always think you should have severe headache, but more than half of it don't experience any headache. And glaucoma is affecting the optic nerve, but first the retina the periphery. And when you lose vision in your periphery from the side, you don't realize it because you don't see what you can't see. And only when the visual field is already pretty restricted, people would see it and realize it, something is wrong and would go to the ophthalmologist. Glaucoma in the aging population would be very well treatable. Another cause is related to diabetes, that you get the macular edema. Macular edema means that in the retina, in the center, you have a macula. Your retina has a diameter of about three and a half centimeters. The macula has a diameter of about roughly two and a half millimeters. So it's very, very tiny. But in this tiny part, uh, most cones which are for dye vision responsible are packed in. And with that small part, you see very sharp. You have the feeling that you see over all your visual field sharp, but that's because you move all the time your eyes. And each time the brain gets a sharp image, it puts it together like a puzzle in your brain. And then if you have the feeling you see everything sharp. And when this small part is affected and doesn't see very well, you see blurry, you see, might see distorted. And the most important thing, you can't recognize any more faces. Reading is very difficult. Uh, do things in the near space, also, also handicraft, handiwork, etc., becomes very difficult. And that's also the typical symptom of age related macular degeneration. Complicated word for something extremely common, but we don't, as long as we are not affected, we don't think about it. But mm -hmm. in the population of 70, 25% of the population has some form of macular degeneration. Uh, from 80 onwards, one third of the population, 90 half of the population. And we say by 100 years, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's those numbers are very striking. And I, I thank you for, for sharing, you know, that, all of that detail of the burden, but also I think the numbers really 
yeah. hit home. Um, you know, the other stat is that often vision loss in older people is preventable. I think 73% of preventable vision loss occurs yeah. in older people. Um, but, you know, of course we've, you know, we're talking about, you mentioned a little bit in, in low income countries and there's, you know, quite a difference between yeah. low income countries and high income countries. So I'm wondering if you can, if you can talk a little bit about the different challenges in both of those contexts. Mm -hmm. I think the less income countries, the main challenge is the medical system is not as developed as it is. So I was once visiting in Mali in Africa. It's a country with 30 million inhabitants. And in 2008, it had 14 ophthalmologists. So you can imagine, and most of them were even based in the capital. So to get people to do the cataract surgery is nearly impossible. So in these countries, lack of the system of ophthalmologists, but also lack of financial resources makes that most people have or go blind from cataract. And cataract could be treated in these countries with an amount for 10 to $20 per person. It's not so expensive, but it's an enormous task and that we call uh, poverty-related uh, blindness. Of course, in all these countries, in less developed countries, people with a good income, they can access. They may be able to afford to go to Europe or the United States or to Dubai, the Emirates, and be treated there. But in the poor countries, the major cause of severe visual impairment is in the overall uh, refractive error. That means access to spectacles, to correct spectacles, that you get the spectacles and that you can afford them. Though in less developed countries, the discrepancy to our countries are extremely. Uh, mm -hmm. In Europe, in the more or the richer countries. In most countries, access to the major causes like cataract surgery, glaucoma treatment is available. Sometimes it's not available to all the different classes, so it can be that there is a discrepancy that poorer people have less success, and very often this access is uh, limited also by education. So it's very important to make sure that also those parts of our societies that have less education get to know about the possibilities to be done. Uh, AMD, for all the severe form of AMD, which is called VET-AMD, which needs injections. So roughly approximately every four to eight weeks a time into the eye. Uh, in many countries, this payment, these treatments are paid for, but there are also discrepancy, for instance, in Europe, that Eastern European countries, access is more limited as it is in Western European countries. And then it comes to the burden that such a treatment means you have to go to a specialized clinics every four to eight weeks. And if you're older and perhaps you're a little bit frail, you might not be able to use public transport or in some countries, depends where you're living, public transport is not available. So you need somebody to come with you each time to the clinic. And then you might ask one of your caregivers, and this might be children or might be spouses, but they have to coordinate it also then with their own schedule. And especially children usually are still working. And so they have to take off a day to bring their mother or their father to the clinic for the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and there's also, I mean, there's a whole host of, of things that we can dive into yeah. there, you know, because as you mentioned, or as you alluded to, these are 
really chronic conditions. Um, chronic and conditions, so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so you are having to, you know, the treatment is frequent, it's robust, it's, it's difficult at times to keep up with. Um, and so really, you know, even for, for people that are still, you know, working, things like that, you know, and you mentioned caregivers, it's a very heavy burden, not just, you know, in the different ways that vision impairment can impact your life, but also the continuous kind of ongoing care um, that's needed. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of challenges and barriers to receiving kind of appropriate care. Um, so I do, um, I want to mention um, Shmuel has left a question. Shmuel is, um, you know, a very active contributor from our Global Cafes, and he did put in a question about, um, you know, poor and low socioeconomic groups of the population. Um, but I think you've you've already touched um, on that. Um, but if, is, is there anything else that you'd that you'd like to add just in terms of even in high income countries, you know, people yes. that are kind of a of lower socioeconomic status? Yeah, okay. I just would, would like to add that the burden of the treatments might be sound high, but the efficacy is also excellent. That means if you have wet AMD and it starts without treatment, you go from 100% vision to 5% vision within one year with the injections. Uh, there might be even at the beginning some improvements of the vision. And in long term, we know that now because the treatment is available for nearly 20 years. And we have people that are treated now for 15 years and more, and they still have vision left, reading vision, orientation, which is a great success. So it's worthwhile to take over the pressure. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to be very aware that also in high income countries, we have poor population segments. And these poor population segments very often are also less literate. And just by the fact of that, they are not accessing the general health system, but also not the health system in ophthalmology. And for many people, it's still granted when you go old, old, you can't hear any more well, and you can't see any more well, and you can't walk any more well. You know, these mm -hmm. old perceptions, they are still there. So they just take it as part of their lives and wouldn't think so. It's therefore very important that we have an eye that also we see the discrep discrepancies in the high income countries. And that we also see that we make sure that there should be an equal access to eye health throughout the whole world, not only the rich countries, because mm -hmm. nobody chooses to be born where he or she is born. It just happens. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a, a good <coughs> point that you make, which is that the treatments are extremely, extremely successful and a lot of it is prevention, you know, the prevent, a lot of kind of vision loss can be prevented um, if you are, yeah. you know, diagnosed and things like that. And, you know, with proper screening um, and, and all of that. And so I think that speaks to really the importance of having the care systems that support the ability to be screened, you know, have your eyes checked. Um, to be diagnosed, to then, you know, be receiving treatment, have kind of a coordination of, of care. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you can touch a little bit on that, the importance of, of prevention and things like that. Yes. Uh, since I'm not a native English speaker, I always have a little bit trouble with the word prevention because uh, prevention no. needs for me, means for me, it will not happen. Mm. And that's probably we can't do. If you wish to prevent uh, AMD, you might have to change your parents because part of this is genetics mm -hmm. and the same for glaucoma. And you can't choose your parents. You get mm -hmm. your parents as they are. So you get your genetic makeup as it is. But what can be done is really 
find and recognize the diseases early. And that's always what I'm fascinated about. Vision is thought to be the most important sense we got. And most people don't go regularly for an IV, IELTS visit to an ophthalmologist. Despite the fact that it is said from 50 onwards, you might at least every two, three years see an ophthalmologist for a checkup to make sure that your uh, eye pressure also is normal, that you don't develop, develop uh, glaucoma, that you can early symptoms of cataract you can see, you can follow up until you see now it's to be uh, has to be operated. A diabetic edema can be also seen very early and the same for AMD. And if <laughs> my, my apologies, if AMD is discovered early enough, you can really make sure that you see the first symptoms of wet AMD that you can treat very early before damage is made. And then you can prevent your vision much better for much longer time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's um, what's important is that though the services can, you know, having good services, having access to primary eye care services, things like that can can help to avoid some of that vision loss and really help to maintain function and, and quality of life. Uh, so there is a question in the chat uh, from Nancy Miller. Um, Nancy, would you like to pose your your question? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm the executive director and CEO of Vision Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired, a vision rehab agency in New York City. And uh, in the United States, there's a real disconnect between the aging network of services and directly serving people with vision impairment. Do you find that's the case in other countries that you have to educate the aging network as much as you have to educate other networks. Yes, indeed. I see this in Europe. I see it in Latin America, everywhere. The aging societies, they are really fixated on healthy aging. And they have the feeling that nothing is going to happen when you are going old. And it's very difficult to talk to them because for them, uh, like getting having a handicap is like failing aging in a way. And it's very difficult. And I, I don't understand this because it's normal, but the aging society are still concerned about how can you do most of it and just exclude disease, exclude uh, handicap, all things that happens in the, when you are aging. Mm -hmm. And we try that all over to get connected, but we feel it, it is very, very difficult. Thank you. Yeah, I want to, you know, it's an interesting, an interesting point because I think the the burden is particularly high in in, in older populations, yeah. but there is, there is this disconnecting, you know, we see it in our own work where oftentimes, you know, we'll be at, you know, a big vision meeting or something like that, and we're the only organization <laughs> um, focused on aging. Um, but, you know, to me, that connection is so clear because the burden, you know, this affects so many older people. And I'm wondering what, <laughs> if you have any thoughts, any thoughts on that? And, you know, how do we make that connection between sectors? You know, I'm now also in the senior age group. And uh, in the area where I'm living, they have opened by the seniors organization, a cafe where elderly people that have troubles with the computer could come and they would try to solve the problem and to teach. And so I thought, okay, I called them first and said, listen, I have some experience how we can make accessible an iPhone, how you can make use of voiceover, how we can use about magnification. Oh no. We don't need that. That's not necessary. People can handle it. And then I just went by curiosity to go to the cafe. I'm an older person too. 
and just set in. And within 10 minutes, I had work. And it was really fascinating to see that they said, ah, oh, we didn't know. We didn't know that you can do that. And yeah. before, they just said, no, people don't have the problem. And I was sure people had the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it speaks to the importance of, you know, having ah, lived, yes. people with lived experience um, kind of and perhaps we visually impaired elderly people, we should start to infiltrate the senior organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, yeah. you know, speak to the, to the importance of it, because I do, I always find that, you know, a little bit shocking <laughs> from, my, from our side, because we're, to me, it's so clear, mm -hmm. but I do think sometimes that there is a bit of a, you know, the vision people are over here, and the people who work in aging are over here, and they're very disconnected at times but really it's kind of the same the same goal of you know ensuring function yeah. you know ensuring good quality of life um you know what you mentioned you know makes me think about the importance of the environment and having you know enabling environments um I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about about that you know what is the important for people with blindness for vision impairments you know, how important is it to have an environment that actually supports them and and what what kind of things are useful in that sense? Yes, I think the environment is very important. So you have fine on one side you have the environment outside in the in the streets, when you go to public places, etc. So that for instance, when you have stairs, that the stairs are marked have a good contrast, that they have a line that you can see it. And I think many of those things that are for people that can't walk very well are also for people with visual impairment, good illumination, that it's not too dark. Uh, one of the first symptoms of age-related macular degeneration is that you can't see as well anymore in nighttime. And this is an underestimated symptom because everybody says, oh, I see less when it's dark. But people with age-related macular degeneration really see severely less in nighttime. But it means also when you come from the sun into the shadow, your adaptation is very sm slow. And until you get adapted, it takes time. So the risk of falling is there. Then you have the environment, which I believe it starts to be even more and more uh, challenging. That's the digital environment. The digital mm -hmm. is run by young people that are very quick. And among the population 80 plus, we still have people that thought, oh, I don't need to learn the computer. But nowadays, you can't do anything without it said, just check at www something and you will find it or just screen the QR code. And <clears throat> smartphones have wonderful techniques in there. But when you have a certain age and you can't see anymore so well, uh, to learn something new is pretty difficult and it takes time. And I think we have to be very careful as societies that with the digital run and the but how we like it, everybody, and it seems to be more fun that we don't lose a part of the people that are elderly, but also all the elderly people with visual impairment. Mm -hmm. The yeah. younger ones that I think my group, age group, we grew into it the majority. But mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, we have seen, and I have seen a study from Canada that in rural areas, when they started to have uh, introduced in the clinics with Zoom, that in the rural areas, a lot of people had not had access to internet. So it's not only yeah. a problem of the less developed countries. They might be even better because there they have invested much more than we 
you that used to have landlines. Mm -hmm. So their system is mo mostly better because they're related on the satellites very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's that certainly, you know, there's pockets of this in every yeah. country. Um, yeah. And, and certainly also that people sometimes can't afford the more expensive smartphones that have all these very nice tools for magnification to speech output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it really, that, you know, brings it yeah. back to kind of as we were talking about in the yeah. beginning, the, you know, health equity considerations and things like that, that also impacts not only your ability to be, you know, have your eyes checked, be diagnosed, receive treatment, receive, but it also your ability to receive AIDS, mm -hmm and things that can that can help yeah. um and i think to, what's mm -hmm. also underestimated is the impact on the social life if you mm -hmm. can't recognize anymore the faces you walk along the street you were used when you see somebody that you know that you would start to smile and then to say hello if you can't see the face only in the distance of one meter you can't do that anymore mm -hmm. and people then might be perceived as being arrogant or perhaps somebody thinks oh last week she greeted me and now she doesn't greet me is she angry with me and these are very difficult situations so that sometimes elderly people tend to go back to their own homes not to go out anymore because they feel it too frustrated to be somewhere where they know there must be a number of people I know, but I can't see them just to avoid it and then get socially isolated. Mm -hmm. And that's clear that depression is then really taking part. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you think that elderly people on the same times, they lose peers because peers pass away. So you have naturally already less acquaintances and friends because of the age and then you don't see them anymore then you can get very very isolated and lonely mm -hmm. and I think it's it speaks to the impacts on your life is become so great <laughs> when you have yeah. you know because once you know, you're, you're speaking about kind of the social impact, the mental health impact, mm -hmm. be, which, yeah. you know, goes beyond um, just the physical, um, but then, you know, really does impact every facet of, yeah. of your life. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I want to ask, I want to, you know, look forward a little bit, you know, what, what do you think, um, you know, what are you advocating for right now? You know, what are some of the achievements that you feel have been realized in terms of um you know whether it's environment or whether it's eye care um and what what is still needed to be done yeah there is many things to be needed to be done of mm -hmm. course we as retina organization we advocate mainly to have more research done that better treatments are developed that pre treatments with less burden to the patients are developed, but also that treatments are accessible. And also the new treatments that will come for the dry form of AMD, that people will have access and will have mm -hmm. access also in other countries. And in order to get there, we have to make sure that eye health and vision is on the screen of the politicians. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the new health uh, strategy that has been developed in the EU, the European Union, there is no word about vision in there. Can you imagine? Yeah. And this should be, because vision is so basic to a lot of things we do. And uh, the same is also for the United States and other countries and to get vision and vision health on the agenda. And I think we are in a society that's growing older in many countries and in many countries uh, in Europe also, we will have to work 
later. And many people here in Switzerland, we have still the retirement is at 65. But if I look around from my friends and colleagues, most continue to work. Mm -hmm. And this work of the elderly population is absolutely needed because labor force is so scarce at present. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful thing to have that we have scarce labor force. But then you have also a loss of income. And I know that in many other countries or also in the US, many people have to work after 65. And if they can't work because of visual impairment, it's a loss to society. It's for themselves a very clear loss of income. And this is very important that we make sure that treatments are available, that we can continue to work. And for those that visually infer, are also get the support to stay in the labor market. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, that's an important point, I think, particularly for governments, for policymakers, is that there really is this huge economic impact when you think yeah. about productivity. And if you're mm -hmm. kind of looking, looking at the problem through that kind of economic lens, and, you know, for most, in most countries, primary eye care services, you know, just having your eyes checked, things like that, are not really included in the yeah. universal health universal health coverage, right? Um, which to me is a huge, a huge gap. Um, but what is the argument to government in order to put this on the agenda? Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, we have breast cancer prevention on the agenda. We have mm -hmm. uh, cancer for the men on the agenda, and it's clear that they should go for prevention, and it's covered. And I think at the same way, uh, prevention for eye health and eye diseases should also be covered. And I think it has so many aspects that it is worthwhile to cover it because from 50 onwards, eyesight is changing and people are still driving. And if they don't know that they see not anymore enough to continue to drive, it's really a danger for the public outside, for everybody, but also for the person, for themselves. and. So I hope that I still will see it, that prevention and eye health is really something on the policy and that it should be covered. And I think we have to do also a little bit the change in our opinion. Uh, health insurance usually just pay for disease and they don't pay for prevention of the disease. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it would be worthwhile to invest more on the prevention of disease uh, than to have to pay when, as we say, the baby is already thrown out with the bus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is uh, just a comment in, in the chat from Louise Gillis. I'm wondering if you wanted to pose, pose your comment, Louise. Louise, are you on the line? If not, I can I can read it out just because um, Louise has just mentioned a program from the Canadian Council of the Blind called uh, GTT or Get Together with Technology, uh, run by persons with sight loss, and um, all ages are assisted in any sort of technology at their own pace. Um, and there's you know Leslie on the line. If you want to share a little bit more, please. Uh, do you kind of raise your hand or, or unmute um, as it'd be interesting to, to share a little bit, a little bit more. Um, hi, it's Leslie. No, Sorry. Oh, hi, Leslie. Hi. <laughs> no, no, not a problem. Uh, yeah, thank you. So Get Together Technology is a, is a, a service that Canadian Council of the Blind provides to any Canadian with vision loss uh, in any age. And it is run by people with vision loss. Yeah. So you're, you're, I, I agree with what you had, had said earlier, Christine, that it's the peer to peer is yeah. so needed. 
uh, and so helpful. It's the best way to learn about uh, your vision loss, learn about technology or how to use technology. Um, for example, I, I use um, uh, screen reader software, but the only people that can teach me properly how to use it are screen reader software yeah, users, absolutely. really, right? <laughs> they can walk you through things. Um, so it's, um, yeah, Get Together Technology, uh, it, it's uh, it's a great program, and, and they do break it down, you know, for Android users, Mac users, that sort of thing. So you can join different groups, uh, it's an open conversation, or you can do one-on-one -on -one conversation with um one of the folks on GTT as well, and, and they can spend time to, to teach you the technology. So it's very helpful. And of course, I think we, a lot of people know in Canada, we are very much an aging population right now. Um, so we even find with Canadian Council of the Blind that um, a lot of our members are seniors now. Mm -hmm. um, the so. good thing about that is they're joining the groups. So they're meeting the peers, which is really good. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but it it I totally uh, understand the difficulties as um, for seniors as to learn the new items, learn the new technologies, and that sort of stuff. So that's one area that we're really trying to help focus on too. So thank you very much. I absolutely agree with you. I'm also here involved what we call Apple School, Apple from the iPhone. And it is also a patient-led peer group for how to teach, how to use Android, how to use Apple. And we do, as you do, peer-to-peer. -peer. We do groups. And we have also uh, four times a year, have one week somewhere. And the sharing is one of the most important. People are coming to learn to use the iPhone. But as a matter of fact, I think the benefit most by the experience that they get in the exchange with other peers, and many of them are also elderly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Leslie, for sharing that and, and coming on to the Global Cafe and, and speaking a little bit about the program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's just there's another uh, question in the chat from Mina. Mina, would you like to to come forward and pose your question? Thank you very much for uh, giving me uh, this time to pose my question. And uh, the the reason I'm coming from the Geneva Foundation for Medical Education and Research. I represent that. And I also work with the International Society for Cancer in the Older Population, Geriatrics. So from that point of view, I'm very interested to know uh, that could we uh, have uh, more strengthened collaborations for education of the older people, health education, because uh, having come from both the, the developing uh, low and middle income countries and having worked work, I find uh, the most important thing is that uh, we as older people are left behind once you've finished your maybe professional work, or even if you're in the prime of you get, edu uh, you know, you get educated, you have uh, means for, for getting uh, some information. And it could be, uh, you know, misinformation, disinformation. But could there be uh, through this IFA? I I want to hear from you if there is some way that we can collaborate for education, uh, yes. you know, across the board. Thank you. Uh, yes, you are based in Geneva, so that's not far too far away from my place. So oh, I'm based wonderful. in Zurich. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm in Warsaw. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. we could uh, connect and see what we can yes. do together. And I would okay. say with my colleagues here, and I would be pleased to put you in touch. And I just would like to point out, so should you have the Swiss citizenship, I kindly ask you to sign the inclusion initiative. This is an initiative la launched by people with disability to just to mend this gap between people with disability in age and people with disability as younger people. Because we have in Switzerland uh, discrimination of the elderly people in the sense that as a young person, you get 
the auxiliary aids paid. And when you are older, uh, it's an old way of Swiss thinking. You had enough time to spend to save money for the risk and the, of age, and one risk is disability. So you can pay majority of your auxiliary aids yourself. So I invite you to sign if you can. Thanks very much for, uh, for sharing Hope, that. Uh, so, Katrina can yeah. provide us the uh, emails so that we can contact. Mm -hmm. I yes. put mine on the yes. chat. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. please. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we'll be sure to, you know, please do give us um, give us the information um, to share with people so that they can they can go ahead and, and sign those that are based in, in that area. So I want, so we have about time for one more question before we go back to you, um, Christina, just for some key messages. And I just want to end on, you know, what, what can older people do? What should they be doing um, to either, you know, promote good, good vision health, um, but also as a whole, you know, recognizing that a lot of these things have to do with environments and health systems and and governments and and things like that as we've spoken about today um but i'm wondering you know what is the the forward thinking for older people and and what can they be they be doing to optimize their own vision health and take care of their own vision health i think one part of why people don't go to see the ophthalmologist is they are in a way afraid and I don't want to have the stigma of being vision impaired or being blind. Mm -hmm. Because I have the feeling that when you are a handicapped person, you are outside of society and you don't want to do that. And this is a phenomenon of stigma that we know through all age groups. But I think it's even more in the elderly age group. So that those people that have made experience, that they speak up talk to their peers and through peer-to-peer -peer communication, convince the others also just go and have your eye checked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, some people have mentioned in the chat, you know, in, in certain areas where this is covered, um, you know, but there's also certain areas where it's not. And so in the, <laughs> I would I would emphasize that, you know, there's still work to be done in terms of the yeah. systems as a whole. Um, so I want to just take a take a moment to introduce next week's speaker for the Global Cafe prior to going back to you, uh, Christina, for key messages. So I hope you'll all join us next week uh, for for our Global Cafe, which will be with Professor Heather Keller on improving the health and quality of life of older adults through food and shared meals. Um, so please do, do join us for that. That should be an interesting conversation um, as, as it always is every Friday um, at the Global Cafe. So I do want to go back to, to you, Christina, just for your final takeaway messages and just final thoughts for the audience today. Thank you very much, Katerina. I think it is very important that people know you can do something for your eye health and you can have early diagnosis. You might prevent severe visual impairment, but also one of the important messages in my opinion is, yes, there is possibility that you get visually impaired and sometimes you just can't avoid it but please know it's not the end of the world we have today so many possibilities uh, of techni technology and auxiliary aids that make it possible that despite the visual impairment you can have a good 